Welcome back to Inclusive Design 24, brought to you in partnership with Barclays Access, the Paciella Group, Intopia, Microsoft Edge, and Open Access Technologies. Don't forget, you can subscribe to Inclusive Design 24 on YouTube by visiting youtube.com slash Inclusive Design 24 and hitting the subscribe button. Uh, also, don't forget to follow ID24Conf on Twitter. And if you have any questions for the presenters, tweet them using the ID24 hashtag, and we'll ask them at the end of the session. Uh, we are being joined for this session by uh, ID24U London uh, at Goldsmiths Department of Computing, uh, University of London. Uh, nice to have you on the stream. So next up, we have Elmiro Stain, who is going to be talking to us about killing accessibility with five words. Take it away, Elmiro. Welcome to today's matinee feature. A tale of murder so fell that only the bravest dare to venture any further. This tragedy is brought to you by Almira Stain, who goes by the tweet name of at cryptos underscore RSA. Gather close, all ye with courage, for today's tale is fraught with misadventure. Meet our heroic developer, who on a warm sunny day finds the wonderful world of coding. A world where droves of good tooling abound. From this treasure, our hero selects fancy tags. A tool so powerful that an abundance of websites appear in no time at all until the day they hear a rumor that many cannot use their sites. Our hero is not hindered. They will learn about this accessibility magic. So they scour the digital lands from east to west. But there is little to find, particularly information relating to fancy tags. So they turn to the great oracle of Tweet and ask, how can I make accessible magic with fancy tags? Then the oracle speaks with great condemnation. Thou should already knowest this. Only on a site of the great static HTML is accessibility to be found. Thy framework is not accessible. Thine quest is doomed to fail. Our hero is crushed. This cannot be. All my training cannot be for nothing. All my peers do not speak false. No, it is his accessibility magic that is false. I shall not be thwarted. I shall continue on the path I know. And so our hero returns to the beginning of this misadventure with accessibility doomed to die. The end. So there you have it, folks. In this whodunit, we just watched the killer of accessibility with the with five words, your framework is not accessible. And if this had really been a movie, it may have had a tagline along the lines of, Inspired by true events, the names have been changed out of respect for those involved. Usually I like to talk about technical issues, but this time I would like to talk about a barrier to accessibility that I encountered myself. But luckily, my interest in accessibility was so strong that my story ended up far happier than the tragedy we just witnessed. To put this into perspective, I'd like to share a bit about my own history with you. What feels like a long time ago now, I was a professional scientist. In fact, I was a laboratory chemist, a career far removed from front-end development. Although I also have an education in computer science, I ended up in a lab, a laboratory that looked not at all like the picture you see on screen now. In movies, we always see the scientists walking around such highly colored flasks that are boiling profusely, just before shouting, Igor, the plans! But in real life, this rarely happens. Some of my most complex reactions happened in a flask no bigger than my thumb, in which a vile yellow liquid stirred. 
And if there were any plan fetching required, I had to do it myself. But I digress. The point is that I did not start out my prof professional life as a coder. We can never assume anything about someone's background and knowledge. Some of us started coding early, some of us later. Some of us found accessibility early and some later, and many are still to find it. But how did I take my first steps into development? Well, when my boss heard that I had some computer science training, I was instantly handed the laboratory database and I had to wing my way in writing applications to analyze some sample data. I loved it so much that eventually I made a career switch into programming. For years, I coded on various platforms and the silent truth is that it took me almost 15 years to even hear that the concept of accessibility existed. Yes, here I sense some of you looking as shocked as the monkeys on the screen, but it's true. I simply did not know it existed. And because of that, I did not know to look for it either. Sometimes I think about the tweets we write along the lines of, do accessibility, it is your job. And I have to wonder how it would have made me feel back then. Also, should I now feel guilty for all those years when I made inaccessible software? How is someone expected to know about a subject when it is so often hidden in the dark corners of documentation? As a developer, one has to work very hard to remain relevant. The whole topic of JavaScript fatigue has become such a buzzword in the community that there are entire conference talks dedicated to it. So it's only reasonable to expect that a developer will invest the time they have on topics they find important for their jobs. I know I did. Only when the accessibility penny did drop for me, so to speak, did it become important enough for me to give it the priority it deserved. I first got introduced to the concept of accessibility on a project where it was taken very seriously. Education was provided to team members about the importance of it and real world examples were given. I cannot stress enough how important this was. This was what made it real for me. I realized that it was actually related to a real world problem, not simply a set of rules to follow or a stick to avoid. No, this affected real people and that made all the difference. When that became apparent, I did invest serious time, and soon I was fighting hard for accessibility to happen. And when my time on the project ended, I kept on fighting on the next and the next, even though this can be very hard in teams where inclusive design is not yet appreciated. During that time, I also learned that a very strong armed approach to accessibility often pushed developers further away. It took me a long time to find a balance between sharing the importance and realizing that not everyone finds it as important as me yet. This is something I'm still working on. But one of my biggest surprises in this new world of accessibility was that as a coder who loved working in modern front-end technology, I sometimes had to deal with what seemed like attacks from accessibility folk. Were they meant as attacks? I cannot truly imagine that they were. Just like I have often strong-armed people about accessibility when I meant it well. But it did make me doubt. I mean. Was I part of the accessibility crowd now? Were we all working together? It was hard to imagine sometimes when entire conversations ended up with me defending the technology I was using. I was hungry for accessibility information, but in these conversations, I found very little of that. And even to this day, when I hear something like, that website is inaccessible because of React or any other framework, I still get reminded of those days and how it made me feel. Over time, this has made me think that inclusiveness is not just about creating websites everyone can use, but it also includes to, extends to technology inclusion. When I found accessibility, I was already quite proficient in front-end framework technologies. Unfortunately, I often got the idea that in order for a site to be accessible, it had to be built in static HTML and maybe only a sprinkle of vanilla JavaScript. Now it is can be 100% correct that sites built with these two, that they are easier to make accessible in some cases, and they will often work on a wider range of devices out there. For example, HTML only on devices that do not support JavaScript. But perhaps we could be more inclusive of other technologies and recognize the niche that they fill. Excluding others' technology choices off the bat can have negative consequences. 
Let's have a look at a real world example. Very recently, something happened on Twitter. As I tell the story, or maybe even when you look at the slide, it may already be familiar to you. Well, it all started with a tweet by Max Stoiber, a well-known figure in the React community and creator of the styled components library. He posted a simple CSS question. Given a CSS class called red that applies the color red and a CSS class called blue that applies the color blue that's defined thereafter in the style sheet, what would the resultant color be for two HTML divs? These HTML divs each had the class supplied in the opposite order. The correct answer, of course, was blue due to the CSS cascade, as the order of declaration in the HTML has absolutely no impact. However, out of almost 15,000 responses to the poll, only 43% answered correctly. There are many graceful and educational ways to respond to a post like that. However, this being social media, that unfortunately did not happen. Instead, the opinion of the CSS in JavaScript proponents was that this was a perfect advertisement of why CSS in JavaScript was necessary, because CSS alone is complex and therefore fails. While the peer CSS proponents felt that this was a perfect example of how CSS in JavaScript fails, as it keeps people from learning CSS and people should understand it. Both groups' views have an element of truth, I believe. Front-end developers should know the cascade if they are going to use CSS, even installed components, as it will make you a much more effective and not totally out at sea when you venture out of that stack. Or boosting your productivity with a tool is always something to consider. Just because you understand something does not mean you need to code it over and over and over again. But the conversation went something along these lines. Firstly, a disclaimer. They're, these are totally paraphrased quotes. And even though it seems that the CSS crowd started the fight, it wasn't really the case. These kind of social media arguments usually erupts like a carpet bomb, but I have to start somewhere, so here goes. You cannot call yourself a web developer if you only know CSS and JavaScript and don't know the CSS cascade, said the CSS crowd. The JavaScript crowd was quick to respond. Oh, really? I don't even want to learn your archaic knowledge anyway. We work with the real web technologies. And the reaction to this was as follows. How can you say that my knowledge does not matter, said the CSS crowd. How can you say that my knowledge does not matter, responded the JavaScript crowd. Can you have, guess what happened then? On the screen here is a picture of four men. This is clearly a reenactment. But they're all dressed in medieval battle gear, and they're already really getting into the spirit of ancient warfare. Guy 1 is storming towards Guy 2, who has his pike ready. Meanwhile, Guy 3 is hacking at Guy, guy 1's leg with his axe, while Guy 4 is bringing up the rear, leaving an obviously dead Guy 5 behind on the battlefield. And in the background, tons of spectators. That is what Twitter looked like for days. Tempers flared up, people accused others of insulting their knowledge, then went on to insult the knowledge of others. And in general, each group belittled the other's group's technology. Can you guess what the netto effect of this was? Well, this screen shows a pie chart plot of the knowledge transfer that happened during this incident. It is based on a very carefully crafted mathematical model of that day, plotted carefully for your viewing pleasure, and it clearly shows that a grand total of 0% knowledge got transferred between the warring factions. Can anyone guess why? I think it's because our gained knowledge and skills are very dear to us. It takes a lot of time and effort to become proficient at something. So if someone completely brushes this aside, people tend to go on the defensive because no one wants to hear that their technology is irrelevant. And when people are in defense mode, all cooperation stops. All effort then gets invested in defending what you hold dear, while the actual issues at hand need to take the bucket of popcorn and go and sit on the benches to watch the ensuing battle. But what can we do? How can we diffuse these kinds of situations without stepping on too many toes while still addressing the issues at hand? Well, here's an example I found of a response on that very same CSS thread on Twitter. And it comes from Sarah Drasner, another prominent figure of the front-end community. This is what she said. Did anyone else find the results of the poll depressing? 
Regardless of the tools, understanding styles is important for being able to build front-end experiences. And this was a pretty basic question. Do we not have sufficient learning resources for people? Now, this already hinted at the direction she wanted to go in. But she then clarified later with a second response. For those saying this is elitist, I'm not sure why asking if people need more learning resources is being perceived that way. I would make them. If 60% of 14,000 respondents didn't understand a for loop, would you feel the same way? I'm not blaming the devs. Our education is busted. This is right on target. She addressed the problem, did not mince words about it, but instead of finger pointing, she tried to identify the actual issue at hand and how to solve it. And not only that, but she offered to be an active part of the solution. Because developers need real solutions for real problems. Often under heavy deadlines, they need a way to get things done. So it is completely fine to highlight a problem or challenge, as long as one also hints at the way to solve it. And there is a real need for accessibility solutions in front-end technologies, other than static HTML and vanilla JavaScript. Believe me, I've often spent a lot of time looking for them. I love accessibility, but I've sometimes been met with such frustration on relatively simple accessibility matters due to a lack of information. This often leaves a developer between a rock and a hard place, delivering the code on time while having to research the accessibility solution from scratch. Instead, it should be easier to find this information. Could it be that our accessibility education is a little bit busted too? But why should we care about front-end developer, fr fr framework developers rather? Let's have a reality check about these front-end frameworks. Now, these tools are gaining in popularity in a big way, and I mean a very big way. Not only that, but even spin-off tooling are being created. For example, Gatsby.js, a static site generator that is built on React and the React model. To put this into perspective, we will look at three of the big ones out there, namely React, Vue, and Angular. If we then look at the NPM downloads of the three over the first half of 2018, we see that React was downloaded over 55 million times. Angular Core, the main package of Angular Next, over 18 million times, and both Angular 1 and Vue, more than 8 million times each. Of course, every download is not tied to a new app being created. But the vast numbers suggest how many developers out there are using these technologies. Developers who can either build their sites accessibly or inaccessibly. The uncomfortable truth at the moment is that the second option is winning by far. In fact, WebAIM saw in a survey a 60% rise in accessibility issues found in the Alexa top 100 websites homepages in the space of just five years. On the next slide, we see the growth in downloads of these three since 2016. React and New Angular have pretty much skyrocketed, with Vue growing steadily. This gives a clear indication of the adoption rate of these three. They are a force to be reckoned with. But downloads is one thing. How about the sites being built in these technologies? Let's have a quick look at who uses React then. Of course, Facebook created an open source React, so they use it in their own products. It is also used by NPM, Airbnb, IMDB, Instagram, Netflix, PayPal, Pinterest, Reddit, Twitter Mobile, Udemy, Vivo, Walmart, Wix, Yahoo, and many, many more. And then, considering what surfaced in the last few days on Twitter, it is important to mention that the WordPress Gutenberg editor is also built in React. I think we all already know how much of an effect this has had on global web accessibility currently. And this is also a case where the failure of the product to be accessible was attributed to React's tool. Was it the fault of React? I personally think it was instead due to disinterest in accessibility from the management, design, and development teams. But I challenge you to go find the facts surrounding this issue and decide for yourself. Then back to Vue. Who uses that? Well, we've got Facebook uh, using some of it, Netflix, Adobe, Alibaba, Euronews, Grammarly, GitLab, and this is growing really fast. 
As for Angular, Angular was created by Google and they use it extensively in their own products like Gmail, Google Ads, Google Cloud, and Google Pay. It's also used by PayPal, Fitbit, Lego, ABC News, SanDisk, American Red Cross, UPS, The Guardian, and lots more. And this will only increase. And these are major, major players affecting a very large amount of users out there. And some of these players are even dictating the standards that developers are using. If we look at these numbers, just imagine the impact that we can have on accessibility as a whole by reaching these developers. What if we can influence and add to the tools and technology itself? But how can we even propose to do this? Let's look at the current challenges framework developers are facing when it comes to building accessible sites with these tools. Many of the examples in their documentation are inaccessible. New developers copy and paste these examples, and therefore these examples are spreading like a virus in a vast number of code bases. There is a serious lack of information on how to build accessibly in these tools. It is not enough to only have basic static HTML and vanilla JavaScript examples, as you bump into framework-specific challenges when trying to apply these examples. Some will persevere, many won't. There is also a serious lack of accessible UI components out there for the frameworks, especially newer frameworks. Developers will use something from NPM instead of building it themselves, and rightly so. But this once again spreads badly accessible UI components if these packages are inaccessible. Accessibility can also get very hard in real-world JavaScript applications. And I mean ridiculously hard sometimes. Recently, I spent a number of days with, a, with some colleagues just trying to find a semi-durable solution to accessibly link an error message to a group of radio buttons or checkboxes. This is such a common use case, but the accessible examples accept static HTML with pre-selected radio buttons only. Then there are careless comments from those who reach many. A while ago, I spoke at a conference about accessibility. Amongst other things, I mentioned the need for semantic HTML. It was almost the very next day when one of the major speakers tweeted that no one could convince them not to build everything with divs and spans. If only those with this kind of reach will talk about inclusive design instead. But how can we address these? As for inaccessible doc examples, here I propose that we submit pull requests instead of just saying something is wrong. If we know that a specific example is wrong, we already, already know why. Submit a pull request to the docs and get that example changed. It takes more than just one or two people to change a large documentation site. So the more of us that actively get involved, the quicker it will improve. It is not enough to say you should make your docs accessible. Often, even the maintainers do not know how. The lack of articles on accessibility and frameworks. We need framework-specific articles on solving accessibility problems. Think of Hayden Pickering's website, Inclusive Components. Here he goes and solves some issues using React. It is so vital that developers can see these kind of solutions in their native languages, so to speak. So let's show how things can be fixed in our posts and let's step out of our comfort zones and use other technologies so that we can translate the tried and tested patterns into a language those developers can understand. As for the lack of accessible UI components, Building a fully functional components library is a large undertaking, so everyone needs to help here. If you have the time, do so. If not, we can always help the builders of existing major libraries making those libraries more accessible. When I was younger, I did martial arts for a while. One day, I asked my sensei, why is this so hard? And his response was true to a sensei. If it was easy, everyone would already be doing it. And accessibility can get really hard in JavaScript apps. Perhaps we are too quickly saying that accessibility is easy. We think it is easy because we reuse our patterns and forget how hard it was to learn. Then we set developers up with a false hope. When they realize just how hard it can be, they can end up rejecting our further advice or accessibility completely. No, let's rather be honest about this. Tell people where the challenges are and point them towards ways to solve them with examples.
As for careless comments from those with a large reach, well, this is the one that we probably can't change so soon. We could only do this by turning around the opinions of those individuals. But new leaders appear every day, and if they got their learning the benefits of accessibility, they will bring this with them. So once again, reaching the developers on their terms has nothing but benefits for current problems as well as for the future. So that was a lot of talk, and talk can be cheap. So I'm going to try and put my money where my, where my mouth is a little bit. Am I trying to turn things around? Yes. By contributing to the React Accessibility Docs, and these days by developing for Tenon. And do I really love frameworks so much? Yes, I certainly do. There are many reasons I enjoy working with these frameworks. For one, they make me more productive, and that is a good feeling. They also lead to cleaner code bases because I can avoid copy and pasting and just reuse already written code in a sane way. They make testing a lot easier. Front-end testing has come a long way in the last few years, but has been a little bit like the Wild West. Being able to compartmentalize my code a lot better means that unit testing also gets a lot easier. And the test tooling for these frameworks are getting better every single day. Easy testing means developers, including me, will actually do it, and that leads to a more maintainable, less error-prone code base. And finally, that is fun to work with. Thankfully, we are as varied as developers as people are in general, and each developer can find the mode they want to work best in. Having to technologies that support that means I wake up every morning looking forward to building code. I strongly believe that one should just write accessible code. It is not something to bolt on later. So, because it is intrinsic in what I already do, it means that a tool that boosts code productivity will inherently also boost accessibility productivity. It therefore also allows us to reuse already accessible compartments of code. It is really easy to miss something when you copy and paste. Testing these compartments for accessibility adds accessibility testing coverage, and then it speeds up testing for accessibility features when we are using these technologies. And even as an accessibility fan, I still don't want to constantly rewrite the same code over and over and over again, so it certainly makes accessibility more fun to work with, especially when I can encapsulate the more complex challenges that are less fun to think about more than once. And I also believe that it can increase the chance that an entire application will be accessible. Because if you start off by building an application with accessible building blocks, it must surely increase that chance. It will never guarantee that the result is accessible and will never be a replacement for accessibility knowledge. But if you build an application with inaccessible building blocks, it will definitely ensure that your application turns out inaccessible. By encapsulating base accessibility concerns in these reusable blocks, you then allow the developer to focus rather on the rest of the application's accessibility. So, meet Tenon UI. This is a new library of accessible React components. I'm heavily involved in a Tenon. At Tenon, we embrace technology as long as it does not stand in the way of accessibility. So while this library is still in its infant stage, it is something we will develop to our own accessibility standards and use in our own applications. But all of this, we will then wrap up in an NPM package for developers out there to use. So out of Tenon UI, I want to show our WAI ARIA tabbed interface as an example of the points I just mentioned. Tabbed interface controls are notoriously badly implemented on the web, with about as many patterns showing up as there are examples of tabbed interfaces out there. So first, let's see what is required for such a control. Because all this information we can then distill down and add to our component. Well, according to the ARIA design pattern specification, it needs to tell people that it is a tabbed interface by applying the correct roles, such as tab list, tab, and tab panel on the correct elements. It needs to let people know that a tab is selected with ARIA selected. Only the selected tab should be in the focus order of the browser. So we need to implement rolling tab index. It should also allow navigation using the arrow keys. And finally, it should be easy to reach the content of the tab panels. So what would a developer find 
when going to the official documentation? Well, going to the official W3C document gives a JavaScript file of 255 lines of code in vanilla JavaScript. Now, this is code a framework developer needs to go and translate. Just imagine the barrier for a developer new to that framework. But please, my purpose is not to insult this document. It is amazing that folks would take the time to put this together, and it is utterly valuable. I'm simply trying to illustrate what a component developer will be faced with. Translating so much vanilla JavaScript into a reusable component can take a long time. With proficient React skills and decent accessibility knowledge and the help of expert colleagues, it took me the best part of a week to get this tabs component functional and properly accessible. How then about reusability? Well, vanilla examples are usually built to inject functionality to specific targeted elements in the HTML. However, when developing components and using them declaratively, the developer can, and at some point will, place more than one of these components on, a, on one page. So what if the developer translated the official code one-to-one? -one? Would it allow two components to coexist on one page? Well, we see that part of the example assumes only one tabbed interface on the page, and that's the first line of code, where it's doing a document clear query selector all on roll tab list and selecting only the first one. Other code will operate on all tabs and tab panels. And that is the next snippet of code that shows that all tab and tab panels are selected in the code to operate on next. So aside from transla translating this code, the developer now has to also go and recode this example to work as a component. And then, with humble apologies to the author of, the, of this part of the document, I really know that keeping docs actual is hard and sometimes impossible. But here it also shows the use of e.keycode, which is marked as deprecated in other docs of the W3C. I once again want to stress that my goal is not to insult this document, but simply to show what I myself had to deal with on many occasions and why we so badly need these examples for frameworks as well. These documents are perfect for developers who do use static HTML and vanilla JavaScript, though. But today we will not look at the details of the actual code uh, of this React example as it is React specific. But what is possible if we take a magic wand and wave some React magic dust over the code we just saw? Well, what we get is a working tabbed interface. And please note that what you see on screen here is actual working React code. If you dig into the presentation later, you may see it running in an iframe. It is simply due to limitations in my blogging software. React code can easily and seamlessly be integrated into the HTML of your page at any point. But that said, let's have a look at it go. And I would like to illustrate that only the active uh, tab is uh, in the focus order of the browser. I can also easily reach the content of my tab uh, panel, either with the down arrow key. We've also decided to do it with the tab key. When I use my right arrow key, I'm selecting tabs uh, rolling over to the right. When I select, uh, use my left arrow key, I'm uh, selecting tabs rolling over to the left. Um, and this is all fully accessible uh, under the hood. For the record, the React version that you see here, uh, including the view, as you code the view directly in JavaScript with JSX and React, comes to 257 lines of code. That is smaller than the total vanilla version if I were to add the HTML template, because React makes some things easier for you. But lines of code should not be the total measure of a solution, so let's have a look at how one uses uh, this component. And this is the resulting abstraction. Yes, that. That is all there is to it. That is the actual code that you write when you use this React component. Fully declarative, and you are able to inject any view you want into the tab panels. Those few lines of code hides an entire engine rich with accessibility that you now get every time. Plus, it even ensures that every ID generated to properly label the tab panels is unique, no matter how many tabbed interfaces you use on a screen at the time. All this logic to ensure that it acts as an accessible tabbed interface is managed inside the component, coded once, tested once, and accessible in every case. This example should hopefully illustrate how much accessibility complexity 
can be encapsulated in a component and then easily reused all over. I'm now able to focus on the accessibility of the page itself, as I can trust that every instance of my tab interface will act as an accessible WAI ARIA tab control. I hope that this illustrates what we can achieve and why these frameworks should not be considered the enemy, but rather as powerful tools that we can use to power accessibility into the future. Do you want to know what makes this uh, tab panel tick? Well, this will have to be the cliffhanger of this, specific, uh, this particular talk. Keep your eye on the Tenant blog, as we will soon publish a lot of info about this and other similar, similar controls we are building. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Once again, my name is Almira Stein. You can find me on Twitter as at cryptos underscore RSA. And these slides are already online at almirastain.com forward slash slides. I think it's time to go to the, back to the presenters now and see if you had any questions. Hi, Elmero. That was a great talk. Um, I don't think we have any questions, uh, Joe. Is that right? Um, so, yeah, we've had no questions on the Twitter. Um, I've got a question or two if, if we've time for them. Sure, we certainly do. Excellent. So, uh, that was a great talk. I really loved it. Um, if there was one thing that you could ask framework builders to improve with regards to accessibility, what would that be? Uh, without doubt, uh, knowledge of HTML, I think. Um, just, uh, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's the thing that I, that I find most lacking in the examples is, is everything. It's kind of always demonstrating the power of the framework by attaching on-click handlers to divs uh, or, or spans. Um, so, 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 so that really is it. I think that's the core of it. Nice. And um, I loved your point about... Um, you know the whole the whole tech wars kind of arguments do you have any particular tips for sort of diffusing that kind of a situation if you find it do you find yourself in that sort of tech wars argument well i think as i try to illustrate in the talk is i think it's kind of accepting accepting the other technology um and and accepting that you know, so somebody that takes the trouble, except for if it's a troll, if somebody takes the trouble to to make a point, it's it's usually coming from some place which is usually good, and just mm -hmm. accepting that, accepting that there's truth in it, and, that, and not just brushing that aside. Um, yeah, because I think that's really at the core of, core of it that we can really learn from each other. That um, and and that's something I see see online, and I, I'm a React developer. So I'm going to use the React team as example, but I see that a lot. I mean, I've seen Dan Abramov going online and going like, yeah, I want to talk to view people about how you are doing things or um, this kind of sharing makes everything better. And I think if yeah. you can diffuse the situation by just going, okay, fine. I see where you're coming from, but how, how can we discuss about it and show me what's good about what you're doing? Maybe I can learn from it. I think that could go a long way. Yeah. I think if we are more open about not... Um, Talking down about particular web technologies, I think that's a super important uh, way to go as well. For sure. I see it at a lot of events, you know, oh, I, we don't like this particular language or, or this particular framework. I think if we can encourage people to stop doing that. Yeah. And, and really, if we can just get our accessibility knowledge in there, um, because the community has so much knowledge um, in the field, and just to spread that into into these these other spaces um show them how it works um translate these examples into uh, into framework examples I, I i i'm almost convinced that it will work that, that it has to have an improvement um and it has to show in, in in what developers will then build because developers will just go and copy and paste this code often especially starting out and when you start out and you've copied and pasted and you've made things work then there's usually you have to run into a wall to know to go and change it. But if you just learn it properly from the start, um, so let's go and fix those documentation. Let's go and give them our accessibility knowledge. I think it really is worth it. Mm. And so final question, um, you mentioned the work that you're doing and that looks great. I look forward to seeing that. Um, are there other people who are writing good accessible components that you'd recommend or people who are writing about it that you recommend? Uh, well, so of course, Ryan Florence um, with Reach UI. Um, he's also working on. Uh, he's created an accessible router for uh, for React. It's called Reach Router. 
uh, really recommend looking into in, into that work. Um, Marcy Sutton often, often uh, um, shares her thoughts and solutions on uh, in the area. Just kind of finding, um, yeah, Rob Dobson, of course, very involved on the Google side. Um, uh, so, so there are people in the community that's that's busy with it. We just need more. Um, yeah. And because the voice, I don't think, is strong enough yet. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that's all. That's all the questions that I have. Sure. So I think uh, I think one of the reasons we we haven't had any questions on Twitter is is that it's uh, I find myself entirely agreeing with with what you said, and I think uh, most most people uh, are probably feeling this the same. Um, related to to one of Joe's questions, I have a question of my own. Um, you you uh, talked about uh, Angular a little, um, and um, I I think we can we can say that. Angular today version six point one point yeah. whatever it is um, is you know much improved over over the the the, the, the first uh, yeah. version released um, it, it, in terms of you know all aspects but I mean the the, the documentation is well has has flaws you know it you yeah. know now now the documentation shows uh, and, and and the default output for say um, a text input field is wrapped in a label. So yeah. you know there there is definitely improvements there, but then there are other, other examples which um, are still um, flawed and are not going to have a, a default accessible uh, default um, de uh, accessible uh, out outcome. Yeah. Um, is there a, is is there um, a, a way that as uh, these frameworks uh, evolve and we you know for in, in case of Angular moves to version seven. Mm -hmm. Um, that seems to me like an opportunity where the, the documentation will have to be up, uh, updated, rewritten yeah. to some extent. Is, uh, do you have any suggestions about how we might be able to encourage the authors of these frameworks to, um, at the same time as they're updating their documentation around the, the functionality of, the, of the, the framework, also do the same for uh, ex uh, accessibility? Yes, I think it's very much, um, yeah, it, it, it varies from team to team. Um, but I think it, yeah, what I've noticed is that so, sometimes the kind of head-on collision works against us. Um, just going to a team and say, oh, that's all wrong. You must change it. It's not working well. Then people are very loath to, um, to, to move in the direction. Um, I, I would really just recommend just this kind of, working with these teams, um, creating the PRs. I mean, these docs, um, everybody can, 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 can usually contribute to it. Um, and I think the more of that is, the more it will become an issue. Um, it's very hard for me to give an answer for a specific framework or a specific documentation team. Um, but I think it's just kind of how we approach it um, and, and to kind of make it a real situation. I mean, if, if one guy, stands in a corner and shouts, oh, your docs are inaccessible, then nothing will happen. But if 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 100 people are suddenly doing PRs on the docs and say, hey, we really need this, um, then I believe there will be more pressure and more willingness to to accept that. Um, but it is kind of a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult question to to give a definite answer. Yeah, it is, sorry to ask you that. <laughs> but uh, it, it just it just feels like uh, a certain parts of the process, there are opportunities and it's yeah. it, are the ways we can take advantage of them. And yeah. At, at that stage, yeah. uh, and I know out of personal experience that the React team, for instance, are very open to um, to these changes, and I've seen very positive um, signs in the Vue community as well. Um, so yeah, just the other day, um, they were changing a highlighting the, the syntax highlighting on the React website. I created a pull request to say, oh well, that's not uh, uh, the contrast is not good enough, and within a couple of hours, it was fixed and merged. So. Um, so, so that I like to see, and I think the more people that actually create these PRs and give this knowledge to the people, they are very open for it. And um, we just need to kind of bridge that gap. Okay, we just had a question come in. Cool. Uh, from Steve Lee, who asks, I wonder uh, if we can use web components to help a little with cross framework components with great accessibility. And it does feel like web components were one of those promises for how we were gonna yeah. fix this at one stage. Yeah. Have you any thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a, um, yeah, web components gain a lot of traction and then it kind of lost a lot of traction. I've seen gain, gaining traction again. Um, I, I definitely think that there, there, there's something in there. I don't, 
I haven't delved enough into web components to give a very educated uh, answer about it. Um, but it kind of promises what we are doing in the frameworks more natively in the browser so that you can still encapsulate um, accessibility concerns uh, in new elements that are just running straight in the browser. I know um, I've seen, I believe Hayden Pickering was also doing some uh, um, tweets and articles about that. Um, and that it is then more cross browser and cross framework uh, compatible um, than using it, uh, than doing it in, 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 in a framework itself. Um, so, so I think it's positive, but unfortunately, I haven't delved enough into it to give any um, specific pointers. Okay, uh, Joe, any final thoughts? Any final questions? Um, I was actually going to ask the exact same uh, web components question. <laughs> it's something I've been looking into a lot recently. But uh, no, that's it. That's it from me. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Almera. That was fantastic. I uh, just meant to say, if you like this session, hit that button, hit the like button, and don't forget to subscribe to youtube.com forward slash inclusive design 24 for future notifications. Uh, inclusive design 24 is brought to you in partnership with Barclays Access, the Paciello Group, Entopia, Microsoft Edge, and Open Access Technologies, and with thanks to our sponsors, DQ Systems. Uh, we will be back on the hour with Bindu and Anna Homberger uh, talking about understanding cultural differences and the impact on design. Please join us then. <laughs>